Uh, thank you for hosting this conference and for inviting me to speak today. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking about something that is a little bit different, although it's, I think, uh, quite related to these other topics. Um, I'm going to be talking about sexual performance, uh, so as in theatrical performance, musical performance, and sexual labor in this context. Um, so I'm going to try and be as concise as possible and leave some time for questions. Um, so today I'm looking at a particular kind of erotic performance that developed in Istanbul in around 1880, so early years of the reign of Abdul Hamid II, and uh, this is a genre called canto. Uh, this genre was eventually revived in the 1960s, and in modern Turkey it's sort of known for this uh, revival period, um, but actually originated in the Ottoman period, and the Ottoman context makes this era of canto very, very different. Uh, and very, very particular to this time. So here, okay, so here we see a number of canto performers or canto juice, largely in the form of photographs, although we do have one caricature uh, from a noted journalist and fan of the genre. And uh, this journalist, Sir Sarmet Mutar, actually gives us the most commonly referenced description of a canto performance. Uh, he writes, First, there's the lyrics, and then the canto Jew shakes her shoulders to a violin solo, spins around. There's belly dancing and a flirty swinging of the head. And at long last, the action comes, and her feet skip around as if dancing to an old tango, before she hops to the center of the stage like a partridge and is gradually lost behind the curtain. So even though canto is today recognized mostly as a musical genre, in the Ottoman period, it was appreciated largely as a form of erotic performance. Uh, as another writer, Refik Ahmed Sevengil, wrote in 1927, for the audience, neither the music nor the dance was of any real importance. And he added, any aesthetic value as well. Instead, what the audience sought solely was sexual titillation. As it continued, it was the naked woman who attracted attention, stimulating the audience with her body and her movements. Canto stars like these were almost exclusively Greek or Armenian women. And although they sang in Turkish and they had uh, male partners on stage who were of all backgrounds, um, they were, until the Turkish Republic, almost exclusively from minority backgrounds. Um, they were reflective of a long and kind of cosmopolitan theatrical tradition, and their audience was also quite cosmopolitan, although it was limited to Turkish speakers generally. Although there is actually an Iranian connection, which uh, is very interesting, so I can bring that up later. Uh, Opinion of the genre was very varied, even at the time. It was popular among a wide variety of classes, including women of all ages, and we know this from novels and from newspapers of the time. But it was also seen by many, especially among the literati, as kind of a scourge, a disease, these are quotes, and symptomatic of Istanbul's cultural and moral decline under the tyranny of Abdul Hamid II. And it's this latter view that has largely come to dominate the historiography of Kanto and Turkish theater in general. And it's perhaps for this reason that there's actually almost no academic research on these women or on this genre in particular. Uh, so here is a timeline of the genre. And the timeline I have presented here follows for the most part the career path of the most renowned of the Kanto Jews, an Armenian singer named Perus Terzakian, and whose picture was on the previous page. Uh, Peruz was a native of Sivas, and she arrived in Istanbul as a child and first came to the stage in 1880, when she was the age of 14. Over the course of her career until her retirement in 1912 and death in 1920, she was one of the most celebrated figures in Istanbul. As one writer put it, this was the era of the Sultanate of Peruz. Uh, alongside performing burlesque theater, Peruz acted as a courtesan to a number of high officials and foreign dignitaries, including the Iranian ambassador. Uh, and these relationships not only were social relationships, but they also were financially lucrative relationships. For a night of performance, for of singing and dancing, she earned eight medjidias, which is about 100 times the average daily wage at that time. And during Ramazan, uh, when they had the largest audiences, this could go up to 60 medjidias. So this was a vast sum. Uh, over time, she acquired numerous properties throughout the city while supporting and organizing other Kanto Jews into associations and broadening the genre's reach into stage theater, recorded music, and eventually film. Uh, in this presentation, I really want to look at Kanto as, a, as an economic and legal and social phenomenon, and not just solely as a cultural one. Where it's been discussed in previous historiography has been almost entirely just as a cultural sort of development of westernization. 
But I think just looking at it this way doesn't really explain why these women chose to do this or why this was a viable career. So if it's just looking at the cultural as a form of cultural osmosis, then we are kind of losing the particularity of Kanto. So this is what I want to talk about today. So it's worthwhile to look at earlier traditions of Ottoman erotic dance. Uh, in particular, I mean, in fact, the boundaries between erotic dance and prostitution in Ottoman society were always a bit blurred. Um, at times, they were considered a legitimate urban professional class as an, as an isnaf, but they also were largely subject to uh, the sultanic whim regarding the legality of their performance. So just as Orlin was saying, just as when prostitutes were being persecuted by the states, usually erotic dancers were also persecuted by the, by the state. Usually these things came hand in hand. So at times they were supported by and patronized by sultans, but at other times, uh, for example, erotic dancers could be enslaved or executed or also exiled as well. Uh, on the left here, we have two illustrations from the 18th century. And these are of a, a male dancer and a, a female dancer. And the most common term is chengi for dancers. And this actually is usually associated with uh, like Roma, gypsy dancers. Um, but apparently by the 19th century, in fact, most of these dancers were Greek. Um, and on the uh, right here, we have a photograph of an Armenian canto Jew in chengi costume. Uh, well, the term chengi in modern Turkish refers to mostly female dancers. In the early modern and actually pre-19th century period, it was essentially an androgynous term. It could be refused, uh, referred to both male dancers and female dancers. And this is because in early modern Ottoman uh, erotic relations, I mean, the, the normalized objects of desire were both young women and young men. So there is, uh, the term is still essentially androgynous. Um, according to Evliya Celebi, in the 17th century, erotic dancers were generally either sponsored by the court or organized into these sort of itinerant companies that wandered around the, the city. And these companies could be very large, hundreds of members each. Uh, over the course of the 17th century, though, erotic dancers found a new home in the coffee house culture of Istanbul. And particularly through this venue, the coffee house, they also became very associated with janissaries who were sort of the main owners of the coffee house at a certain point. Um, and so this, a new style of erotic dance called kochek evolved in these coffee houses and was closely associated with janissary homoeroticism. Following the suppression of the janissaries in 1826 by Mahmoud II, kochek dance also went into decline. There was a ban on the performance in 1822 in Istanbul, and it was followed by a more general ban in 1854. Uh, male erotic dance, thus over the course of the 19th century, became very indistinguishable from illicit male prostitution. Uh, because if you are already going to be a male erotic dancer, I mean, there's no legal protection for you anymore, so your only uh, economic basis now is prostitution. Female dancers continued to perform, including in male, in male costume, but as the 19th century progressed and European-style performances came into vogue, old entertainments like chengi dance became increasingly old-fashioned. The role erotic dance once played was taken up by prostitution and a new sexual space, the European-style theater. And it's in the neighborhood of Karakoy in Istanbul, which is the, was the port district, that both of these things continue to exist. So there was illicit kurchek and chengi dancing, as well as European-style stage theater and prostitution. All of this was occurring in the port district. And so in these you know, brothels, coffee houses, and unlicensed taverns, all these things continue to interact and offer viable ways for lower class youth to make a living. Katakoi was not only host to a constant migratory flow of sailors, dock workers, merchants, and fishermen, but it was also a prominent attraction for Istanbulites from other parts of the city. Armenians and Greeks had early on came to dominate the Ottoman theatrical culture, and Karakoy was a well-known location for Greek prostitution. So here are some drawings from Istanbul Encyclopedia of Greek prostitutes from Karakoy. Uh, yet the early years of Abdul Hamid II's reign were marked by growing legal pressure upon both prostitution and the stage theater, which made both of these forms of labor increasingly precarious. 
Mm, beginning around the 1870s, the Ottoman stage theater came under increasingly heavy censorship, which culminated in the foundation of the theater inspectorate in 1883. Under Abdul Hamid II, censorship became increasingly capricious and heavy-handed. I mean, there's examples like words like star and nose get banned because the Sultan has a big nose, stuff like this. But uh, more generally, it was nationalist discourse that was the, the problem. Uh, and the, the very capriciousness of the made the theater a very precarious space to perform labor because at any time you could find your play was uh, suppressed and the, your, the writers could be exiled, actors fined. And in fact, the most egregious case was rather like the bachelor houses uh, in Istanbul, the theaters could be demolished after a play was performed that was offensive. So, but the issue was that uh, the censors generally sort of ignored lowbrow comedies. And so this sort of lowbrow entertainment, which was seen as very outside of nationalism, outside of the scope of this political discourse, was able to sort of uh, remain sort of un un uncensored. And so it offered a safe haven for performers to uh, continue to have an income. At the same time, prostitution was coming under regulation from a different angle, from the hygienic angle. In 1884, one year after the theater inspectorate was established, the Ottoman Empire adopted a venereal disease ordinance, which brought prostitution more firmly under the regulatory control of the state. These regulations were in theory humanitarian, but in practice were generally involving the forcible confinement or imprisonment of prostitutes in deplorable conditions. Uh, I mean, in many cases, uh, prostitutes were imprisoned, and then these prisons were actually brothels in and of themselves. Uh, lower class youth were, who were deemed at risk of prostitution were also placed into reformatories, or islahane, with poor or exploitative conditions. And although the legal age for prostitution was set at 18, at least by 1920, and this is a little bit earlier, but I believe the situation was much the same, uh, girls as young as 13 worked as registered prostitutes, and among unlicensed prostitutes, the number of children or youth was much larger. So it was actually among these youth, these 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds, that Kanto first developed. Here we go. So what is most striking about the early Istanbul Kanto scene are the young ages of its participants. Peruz first came to the stage at about 14 years old, and most of her fan base was not much older. Ahmed Resim, who uh, describes visiting a Kanto performance at the age of 16, uh, describes the audience as children of about 14 or 15 years old who would break out into fights with straight razors, knives, iron bars, and sometimes pistols. Okay, so this is a very, very sort of rough scene. Uh, drawing inspiration largely from Chengi and Kochek dance, Kanto Jews began to perform these short sort of s sexual songs in between the uh, acts of more established stage plays. And this offered a way to support themselves financially whilst avoiding the stigma of prostitution. By associating themselves with established companies and theaters, they attained a degree of legal and physical protection unable, uh, unavailable to prostitutes or more marginal forms of labor. As many Canto Jews had worked in the theater or as prostitutes before becoming Canto performers, they made a conscious choice to pursue this career, whether for financial reasons or for greater security. Canto Jews were, of course, hardly immune to sexual exploitation and violence. And Perus, for instance, was attacked by a serial killer at one point. Uh, several countries were killed on stage by jealous lovers or former pimps. Uh, but generally speaking, this association gave them a sort of legal protection which prostitutes and, in fact, regular theater actresses did not have. Uh, familial and social networks were a key to the expansion of the Kanto scene, and this proved especially important uh, when relatives fell into poverty or difficult circumstances. The Armenian Kanto Jew Shamram, for instance, first appeared on stage after her husband was fired from the imperial arsenal following the Hamidian massacres of Armenians, leaving her with two children to support and no income other than minor acting jobs. She was a relative of Peru's, a very distant relative, so she, she soon joined her as an apprentice and became a kind of immediate sensation within the Kanto scene. Kanto Jews often married Muslim members of the theatrical scene, as, such as directors or comedians, and over time, almost all prominent members of the Kanto scene became related by ties of marriage or blood. So there was a sort of condensation of the scene where all these various people gradually uh, formed familial or social ties. They were also connected by master-apprentice relationships, 
And one of the most interesting things is that, okay, I'll finish really quickly, was that uh, Peru's actually founded this association of Canto Jews called the Sahne Yalem. And this is actually, uh, was the first uh, development of a sort of w uh, woman owned and managed theatrical company in Ottoman history, at least that we know of. Uh, and so at the time that this is occurring in the political realm, it's actually the Canto Jews who are doing this in the theatrical realm, in the cultural realm. And in fact, uh, there's actually some uh, articles about Canto Jews within the Ottoman feminist press, which is very interesting. Um, yeah, so, so I'll just conclude here. Uh, to conclude, by the reign of Abdul Hamid II, the suppression of the stage theater and the increasing precariousness of prostitution led Ottoman youth to reformulate earlier erotic dance traditions uh, into this new form of canto, of performative labor. Uh, the, as it eventually moved from subculture to mass culture, Kanto Jews were able to sort of uh, operate between these realms, the legal realm and the illegal realm, and utilize that ambiguity to, to establish themselves and, and kind of establish an economic basis. And many Kanto Jews, although many died in poverty, there were quite a few who actually kind of transitioned from this very lower class existence to a sort of, we could say, middle class existence. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there and then, yeah.